rhythms passed down to us through ancient spirits. Feel the spirit, a unifying force. Come on, move with the spirit. Stand up, clap your hands. Move with the rhythm, just get down. From WSNC 90.5 FM, a broadcasting service of Winston-Salem State University, welcome to Africa World Now Project. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. Today, the politics of memory, naming, and resistance with Ngugi Watidiango and Dr. Mishari Mugo. Africa World Now Project is next. The ability to make language, words extend from the page, to become alive, to dance in the mind of a reader, creating vivid pictures that map time and space, weaving multiple experiences into a common tapestry of human history, is an ability that only a few writers possess. It would not be a stretch to place such writers in the deep tradition passed down by generations of ancient priests, mystics, thinkers, storytellers, and teachers who are often referred to as oracles. In Gugiwati Diango, fits seamlessly in the long line of historical oracles who possess foresight and insight into continuities that crisscross our human past, present, and future. Every group of people have these oracles, but to hear them, to see them, is an art. We have lost the patience and humility to listen to them. These vessels of ancestors, conveyors of deep thought, channelers of truths that provide guidance for our deep human paroxysts often are ignored. Ngugi, as he is known, comes from an old tradition of storytellers, a novelist, playwright, and essayist who sits alongside the likes of Nigeria's Chino Achibe and Wole Soyinka in the modern African pantheon is a recurrent favorite for the Nobel Prize in literature. Ngugi's life encompasses British colonialism and the anti-colonial struggle for Kenyan independence, the tragedy of despotism in a free Africa, and exile, all of which he effortlessly weaves into his work. According to a November 16, 2016 interview in the Financial Times with Ngugi, the author recounts Ngugi's reflection of winning a Nobel. A Nobel would be validating, but not essential. Ngugi Wati was born in 1938 in a village north of Nairobi, one of 28 children. In the 1950s, his older brother, Good Wallace, joined the Mau Mau anti-colonial resistance against the British occupation whose prison camps were described by the then Solicitor General as having been distressingly reminiscent of the conditions in Nazi Germany or Communist Russia. According to previously secret documents released by the British Foreign Office in 2012, the British response to the rebellion was brutal and relentless. It even extended to weaponizing language itself. Further recalling this period, and Googie goes on in the article to say it was the British who gave the movement the name of Mau Mau, as if to say it was a meaningless movement. And Googie reasons that if they had said or called it the Land and Freedom Army, as the fighters themselves called it, then they would have been articulating the aims of the movement. Today, I invite you to listen to a recent reflection by Ngugi Wati Diango and Mishari Mugu on their work, The Trial of Didan Kamathi. The Trial of Dida and Kamathi, a collaboration between Ngugi and Mushari Mugu, is a response to the colonial writings about the Land and Freedom Army, a.k.a. the Mau Mau Movement, which traditionally depicted the movement and its leader, Dida and Kamathi, as mentally unbalanced and vicious. They chose to present a counter-narrative to this image by highlighting how the movement and its leader was seen by many of the peasants and laborers of Kenya. In this reflection, they explore the politics of memory, the relationship between naming forms of power and resistance. Our show was produced today in solidarity with Native, Indigenous, and Afro-descendant communities at Standing Rock, Venezuela, Brazil, Colombia, Kenya, Palestine, South Africa, and Ghana, as well as other places who are fighting for the protection of our land for the benefit of all peoples. Enjoy the program. Uh, Diasporadical. 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 Feel the fire from the cannon. Huh. Fly where you run it. Yeah. Naming and the politics of memory. Kimathi and Kenya, land and freedom army. I have always been fascinated by the encounter between the shipwrecked 
Crusoe and the native he purportedly rescues from cannibalistic neighbors in Daniel Defoe's novel, Robinson Crusoe. Presumably, this native is also a cannibal, but at no point in the narrative does he make any attempt to consume his rescuer. But it is Crusoe's education program that I find most striking. First, he assumes that the native does not know anything about anything, including their own body. So, unlike Shakespeare's Prospero, the earlier shipwrecked, who takes it that Caliban knows the geography of the island, its fresh springs, its natural endowments, and therefore first seeks that knowledge before turning Caliban into a slave. Crusoe seeks no such things from the native. Instead, he sets out to teach the native. The order of knowledge is most telling. He starts with names. Your name is Friday because I discovered you on a Friday. And mine is Master. Note he doesn't say Crusoe. Yours is Friday and mine is Master. We have to assume that pre Crusoe Friday had a name by which he identified himself and was identified by his relatives and neighbors. He also had a name by which he identified the things around him, plants, animals, places. Otherwise, communication between him, his relatives, and neighbors would have consisted of a gesture a la the dwellers of Swift's laughter, who, dispensing the words, carry objects to point at instead of signifying them with sounds. It depends with language, you just point. <laughs> we can also assume that names as words which the native had used before their fatal encounter must also have acquired a history, a memory around them. And this is what Crusoe erases with his renaming system. Names define relationships to self, other selves, and the environment. So renaming Friday is a barrier of previous identity and histories and the new identities and histories. The new names will forever define the terms of relationship between Crusoe and Friday. That is the discoverer and the discovered, the foreign expert and the native recipient, the knowing expert and the native ignomaras, the naming master and the named native. Naming becomes the right of conquest and names the mark of conquest. In my book, Something Torn and New, I have talked a great deal about the politics of memory and the centrality of naming, renaming, misnaming in the power struggle between the subjugating and the subjugated, in our case, the colonizer and colonized. Explorations, preludes to actual colonization of new territories and peoples, went hand in hand with the renaming. America had a name, or names, before Columbus and Amerigo. Canada, too, New Zealand, 
Australia as well. So central was the naming to the colonial process that when one power replaced another, they often re-renamed the same place. That's for a quick example. That's for reason New York had named or which the pre-colonized natives called it. The Dutch colonial occupant called it New Amsterdam. The English conquerors or the Dutch renamed it New York. Not surprisingly, naming has always been a linguistic arm of war, conquest, and subjugations. One obvious way has been the use of terms that dehumanize the opponents. On a small scale, we, see, we saw it in full display during the recent American elections. Trump, early on, discovered the power of projection of his own negative qualities onto the other. And that's why Jeff Bush became Law Energy Bush, Ted Cruz became Lying Ted, and Hillary Clinton, Crooked Hillary. Some of these carried conviction and consistency because indeed they were projections of his own traits onto others. His followers and even the media came to repeat the terms over and over again. Whatever, the repetition of the same, even where the press attributed them to the source, can shape and need shape people's perceptions of the named, the same dehumanization of the other through names happens in all wars, on all sides. But in a situation where two sides are matched in power, where indeed they have equally matched machinery of propaganda, the renamings may neutralize each other. Not obviously the case in colonial and anti-colonial wars in their access to means of propaganda. One side, the colonial state machinery, outmatches the anti-colonial side altogether. Nearly all the armed resistance in Africa, Kenya, Algeria, Guinea-Bissau, Zimbabwe, South Africa, were described as terrorist organizations, and their leaders, or even supposed leaders, from Jomo Kenyatta to Nelson Mandela, described as taking the population back to darkness and death. In the case of Mandela, it was not until 2008 that the Mandela was finally removed from the terrorist list in the USA. Language itself is a vast naming system. And so when one language overpowers another, it acquires, because the language of power and they actually they are quite a monopoly of naming the world, including terms for education and knowledge. In the case of Africa, concepts to fit into the idea of the primitive other become normalized as the basis of new histories and philosophies, and which then come to define reality, even in scholarship, politics, and in national and international relations among groups and processes. Among the most devastating, both in both politics and scholarship, is the word tribe, for reason, I'm just thinking one word, tribe, which is inherited from colonial anthropology. I have talked about the distorting effects of the term in my book, Secure the Base, making Africa visible in the globe. So I'll not dwell too much on it here, except to voice my constant dismay when I hear the term used. I have used the term myself in the past, so I cannot be too holier than thou. But today, it makes me feel, literally, like throwing up when I hear it being used by anybody. So when I, when I used to refer 
to African peoples or any peoples anywhere elsewhere. I ask myself this question. Why are 300,000 Icelanders a nation and over 10 million Zulus a tribe? The Danes are 4 million. Norwegians, about 6 million. Swedes, about 8 million. I've never had any of these peoples referred to as tribes. But 40 million, 40 million Yorubas, or even 60 million Hausas, are tribes. Or equally insulting ethnic groups. 40 million people become an ethnic group. When the word is used in combination with the other, say, tribal wars, then I'm telling you that all thinking and common sense stops. For instance, if there are disagreements, even fatal ones between two leaders in Africa, <clears throat> one has only to look at the communities they come from and quickly conclude that their disagreements are essentially tribal. One looks at leaders in Africa, and all that one needs to know about their politics is to know the communities they come from. Then it oh, this is to do with tribe A and tribe B. Even dictatorships are looked at from the standpoint of the communities they come from. There are many other terms equally reprehensible. European colonial fighters are soldiers. African fighters are warriors. Unless, of course, they have been co-opted into the colonial armies. Suddenly, the former warrior becomes a soldier. As far as I know, there are no communities that I know of where all their members live to fight. In a true sense, the only warriors, those that live to fight, were the standing armies of the colonial state. Because they were there to fight. They were warriors, projection the other. But the notion of the irrational has deep roots in terms like tribes, tribal wars, and tribal mentality ultimately to the notion that colonialism was driven by the ideals of enlightenment, in another words, that continent, Hegel's view of Africa and African people as enveloped in the dark mantle of the night. A scholarship that inherits a vocabulary forged in explorer narratives can actually obscure reality of social inequalities, economic disparities, misrule, the continued consumption of 90% of the resources of the continent by Western corporations. The terms absolve some scholars from thinking altogether, or absolve them from digging up facts and rigorous analysis altogether. Even studies in corruption become studies in the tribal affiliation of the actors. It's as if the corrupt elite, even where, uh, even where they are emissaries of corrupt corporations, suddenly become representatives of the community they come from. For some scholars, this framing of African societies in stereotypes ensure that all social divisions in an, Afri in an African society go by the window simply because they all fit into the prefixed ethnic boxes. And here's the problem. Every African citizen of any nation in Africa comes from a given community. A scholar, any scholar of the continent, African or non-African, is doing a lot of harm, tribalizing 
the analysis of a continent that over the last hundred of years has, a, has undergone the trauma of slave trade, colonial plantations, and today, dead slavery. From 17th century to the present, Europe and the West generally has looted 90% of the African resources to develop Europe and the West. So the real story of Africa is not is how it has survived the loot, the terror, and the trauma of those disasters. But for Hegel's intellectual descendants, even Africans, because there are some who are descendants of Hegel, tribe, tribe trumps all such contradictions. So here, let me digress a little and offer my simple solution for those that really desire to free themselves from the prison house of the tribe. Please call people by the name they call themselves. We talk of the English or English people, the French or the French people, the Germans or the German people, the Chinese or the Chinese people, the Japanese or the Japanese people do the same for Africa and all other peoples, whatever the size of the population. There's of course also the perfectly good word, nationality, for the distinct communities and people that nevertheless constitute the nation or the multinational state. But still, the clearest thing you don't want in ambiguity is if I'm Yoruba, I'm Yoruba, and I come from Yoruba people, okay? Nothing illustrates better the politics of naming than the case of Kenya's Land and Freedom Army, led by Dana Kimathi. Their motto was summed up by their popular words of greetings. And I, even as I, I used to hear this, Maudu no Omere, Idaka na Weyavi. When they met, only two things, two things only, land and freedom. You see, if the British called them by the name they called themselves, then they would have been articulating those fundamental goals of the Liberation Army. But the term Mau Mau obscured the goals. It sounded like some mystical mumbo jumbo conjuring irrationality. The Mumbajoibism, seen as some kind of retreat from civilization, was at the heart of theories of the colonial, like Carothers, Henderson, and Caulfield. In my recent memoir, Bad of a Dreamweaver, I've shown how the three actually drew from each other, like one lie cited to reinforce another. And in the case of Carothers, I've traced his theories all the way back to those of the Cartwright in the American slave plantations, who theorized that the desire of a slave to run, of the enslaved to run away was a mental disease called a dreptomania. But the accounts of activities and character of the Kenya Land and Freedom Army are real extensions with footnotes at all, of the vocabulary of the Enlightenment scholarship, desirous of obscuring the reality of slave trade, slavery, and the barbarism inherent in those practices. A bizarre outcome of this has been scholarly attempts to portray Kenya Land and Freedom Army as a civil war amongst the Agikoyo. Civil war, the term, is driven by this imperative behind tribe and tribal wars. The home, the home guards is actually set up by General Hind in 1954, literally set up by the colonial state, where an auxiliary arm of the British forces they were part of the British Army 
as were all the African members of the Kenya African rivals. Even some otherwise first-rate scholars of the period have fallen victims of this view. And there are some good, very good scholars, but their scholars become obscured by this notion of the uh, civil war, right? I have not kept up with the scholarship on this period of Kenyan history, and I may have missed it. But I would like to see a comparative study of the Nazi concentration camps, and those are the British and those in the British colonial state called detention camps in Kenya. Because the British had just engaged with Hitler. It would be good to compare the two. I recently met a Kenyan scholar in Germany who is looking at the German Herero massacres as the precursor of Hitlerism and the mass murders in Europe. Either way, it all comes back to colonialism. There are many scholars, both African and those from outside Africa, who have done and continue to do excellent work and have produced fast scholarship on the continent. Let us therefore all become scholars of Africa and not experts who work in categories inherited from colonial anthropology and colonial mindset. This may have to start by jettisoning vocabulary of stereotyping and call Mau Mau by its correct designation as Kenya Land and Freedom Army, or simply LFA. And then Kimathi as the first of the many liberation armies that finally broke the back of imperialism in its colonial form. Thank you. We were just listening to Ngugi Wati Diango. We will continue our program with Dr. Mishari Mugo, who explores the politics of naming and self-naming as resistance. Dr. Mugo's work draws heavily upon indigenous African cultural traditions. As a critic, she has also written extensively on contemporary African literature. Dr. Mugo was forced to leave Kenya in 1982 after becoming the target of official government harassment and has worked, written, and taught from abroad since. Currently, she is Professor Emeritus at Syracuse University. According to many African literature scholars, Dr. Mugo is a poet with a mission which embraces the black race, the underprivileged class, and her specific female gender. Born in 1942, at a time when Kenya was still a colonial possession of the British Empire, the daughter of two progressive teachers, Mugo's parents insisted that she receive a solid education. Accordingly, Mugo became one of the first black students to be allowed to enroll in what had previously been a segregated academy. Growing up during the 1952-1956 Mau Mau resistance shaped Dr. Mugo's political trajectory. Her political activity caused her to be forced from Kenya twice. During one of these times, Dr. Mugo went to Zimbabwe where she found a teaching post and continued to write. Her second work of literary criticism, African Origin and Human Rights, appeared in 1991. This work is an exploration of the storytelling culture of the India people in Kenya's Kirinyaga district. It is a meditation on culture's relation to politics. In India culture, Mugo maintains that the orator artist is a defender of human rights in the community. According to Dr. Mugo's argument, the verbal arts express both society's negative and positive qualities, its strengths and challenges, its justice and injustices, its realities and ideals. India elders recount proverbs while less respected groups vent their frustration through satirical stories featuring a hyena or an ogre. Mugo argues that this form allows all to speak freely and that such a deeply ingrained, collectively held freedom of speech is impossible to censure or prosecute. In 1994, Mugo's second volume of poetry, My Mother's Poem and Other Songs, was published. Its themes can be roughly divided into four sections, poems about children and youth, works addressing feminist concerns, others paying homage to the political spirit of the community, and finally verses of a more reflective nature. 
Her poem, Mother Africa Matriots, ties in the political struggle of African women with that of other groups, linking their spirit to uprisings elsewhere on the continent and, and even Black Panther politics in urban America. Her work addresses, but is not limited to, political consciousness, forms of resistance, the role of and importance of women in all aspects of society, and critiques of post-colonial political leadership in Africa. Enjoy the rest of the program with Dr. Mishiri Mugo. Kemathi Maumau and the politics of naming is our broad subject, and my um, side presentation is the politics of renaming and self-naming. So my colleague, comrade, and co-author Ngugiwa Thiongo has just eloquently and compellingly spoken on the politics of naming and their impact on the psyche of the colonized, giving illustrations from the histories of colonialism and imperialism. The tragedy is actually that the misnaming, as he has argued, does stick and did stick under colonialism. In fact, this explains why, among some colonized people, we find African translating their African names so that they have equivalents of, the, the, the English equivalent of them. For instance, a beautiful name among the Shona people like Chipo, which means gift. Then you meet somebody and you are introduced to a lady called Gift. And it doesn't quite register as Chipo, but that's Gift. But there have been even more hilarious examples that my daughters and I encountered when we, were, we lived in Zimbab Zimbabwe and became Zimbab Zimbabwean citizens. There was a young boy at a market that we used to go and get vegetables from called Mbare Market, whose name was Anyway, and another one of his friends who was called Nevermind, and I'm not joking. And then, in fact, there was a third one that we met much later on called Why Not? And I'm not making this up, it's a fact. Colonial forms of imposed naming and self-naming were not just ridiculous, but mischievously cruel to say the very least. They made a joke of colonized people, robbing them of their true identity and dignity, and in fact, cutting them off from the familiar and affirming cultural sites of their upbringing and self-naming. But fortunately, as we all know, history and life are dialectical processes, and so, even as the colonials were busy attempting to erase the identity of their subjects by imposing colonial and foreign namings upon them, many of those targeted were always, always, all the time, busy, resisting, and defiantly engaging in the process of renaming and self-naming, refusing to be the Fridays of Robinson Crusoe's imperialist design, let alone his possible Saturdays and Sundays. More importantly, they recognize the importance of renaming and self-naming themselves for naming and self-naming are critical milestones along the journey of life in most African cultures. And in fact, their significance is ingrained in people from birth. In fact, a lot of the cultures of Africa hold a very special actual naming ceremony that is witnessed by the community because this self-identity is so important and it's also linked to the group. Others even have what is called second birth, which is a ceremony at which an individual's arrival or birth is affirmed, confirmed through another name being given to them or reconfirmation of the original one. To emphasize the significance of naming in African cultures, allow me to illustrate from a personal example. I am one of those lucky formerly colonized people who are fortunate enough to grow up soaking knowledge from and feeding off the world of oriture in the late 1940s and 50s. 
I still recall with a lot of nostalgia those evenings, usually around the hearth, but also in the sitting room following dinner, when my mother or grandmother or aunt would convert the spaces into classrooms, which I shared with my siblings, cousins, and other young neighbors listening to stories. My maternal grandmother in particular was an amazing, amazing storyteller. But before treating us to a storytelling session, she would always begin with the family tree, which in a lot of African cultures was a very important site and place and space for naming, self-naming, and collective naming. It went something like this. For instance, if she pointed at me, she would ask, what is your name? And I would say, my name is Michele. Michele wow, Michele daughter of who? Michele wa Karuga. Karuga wow, Karuga son of who? Karuga wa gedhae. Gedhae wow, gedhae wa giti. Giti wow. And it would go on like that until you went generations back. And I remember there was a time that I could recite my ancestors and sites of namings and, and belonging 20 generations from, you know, um, the, the, when we were young. Sometimes my grandmother would pause and ask the respondent to name a historical milestone associated with the life of one of the members of the family tree that had been in, evoked. So names, as I say, were linked to family major life events, and very importantly, to history. Consequently, this ritual at the beginning of, beginning of each storytelling session by my grandmother took the audience on a journey back, Sankofa-like, in history, making linkages, connections, jogging memories to rememory, urging us never to forget. This is the historical connection that Haile Girima revamps in his film, Sankofa, symbolized by the image of the Sankofa bird flying forward with its head turned backwards while carrying an egg in its beak. Powerful, powerful symbolic image. To wit, this is the significance of the unborn child in Julie Dash's film, Daughters of the Dust where the unborn simultaneously connects the present to the past and to the future, where, paradoxically, the unborn has the spirit and seasoned wisdom of Nana Peasant, the elder matriarch in that film. And beyond Nana, she also has connection to the ancestral world. So Nana, the ancestral spirit and the unborn child merge their voices and urge the peasant family as members are moving from the island to the main island never to forget their names, to carry their names, to carry their identities with them, to carry their history as they migrate and move to another place. They had to make history move with them. They had, as it were, to intervene within those critical moments in order to make sure that the thread had not been broken. So yes, naming is a serious, serious event and process in most African cultures. As indicated, one's name is linked to the family, extended family, the community, and to the ancestral world. At other times, as I have said, naming is associated with life events and phenomena that influence collective social being and individual being. Now this knowledge the colonizers had through the anthropologists or missionaries and so on or collaborators, they knew very well. And hence the reason why under Christian and colonial education, the learners had to be renamed I remember, for instance, when I went to register for school, they insisted on my producing another name other than Michere. And so, luckily, I had one, Madeleine. I, I have no idea what my parents were naming me after or what the name means, but I'm called Madeleine. And you know, I'm ashamed to say it has hung around in my signature. I've got to find ways of getting rid of it. But Madeleine, I became, and there was this very schizophrenic relationship with yourself when you, you were in school, you were one person, one name, and when you were home, you were another person, and so on. Just ridiculous, really.
So then this renaming that Ngogi was talking about. Now a vivid and scary example of this is in the documentary in the white man's image. The documentary tells the story of an experiment conceived in St. Augustine, Florida in 1875, through which Native American children were to be converted into imitation whites. The US Congress actually backed this plan and commissioned the founding of a school in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, run by a colonial educator by the name of Richard Henry Pratt to accomplish this civilizing mission. Young Native American children were forcefully torn from their parents, families, and homes and taken to Carlisle, where they were put in military-like uniform and barracks, had their hair cut, white fashion, and were given white names. In fact, they were not given. They would go and um, pick one from the, from the hat. And whatever you picked from the heart, whether John or Charles or whatever became your name, that is, in fact, how coincidental um, it was. And when you compare this with the seriousness of cultures that really have a place for names and naming, this was a serious crime on the psyche. So then, um, in this civilizing mission, the native children were torn from their families and, and homes and familiar places and then they were taught English and forbidden to speak their own mother tongue. They were also forbidden to visit their homes for five years. During those five years of cloning, deracination and isolation from their homes, communities and culture, these learners were literally drilled into eliminating the Indian in them. The language used to describe this process is really, really chilling. Repeatedly we hear, the only good Indian is a dead one. And another phrase, kill the Indian and save the man. And this was the process to virtually kill the Indian in order to save the man. Man in Western civilization sense. The experiment, of course, resulted in suicide, genocide, and permanent psychological scars among First Nations people. Now, versions of this experiment are to be found throughout the history of colonialism. Franz Fanon was right, therefore, in arguing that liberating physical space, land, for instance, was a much easier task than liberating an invaded mind. Now, writers, artists, educators, and journalists and all kinds of people have a central part to play in the liberation of the mind. Indeed, in Return to My Native Land, upon returning to Martinique from Europe, the first task that Aimé Césaire, the poet, engages in is the renaming of his homeland following years of colonial uprootment and ravaging. He insists on finding his voice and the language to rename his surroundings, the land, the terrain, the flora and fauna, the rivers, the seasons, and so on, using his own language on his own terms. He also learns to tune his ears to the conversations and rhythms, to the conversations and rhythms of speech of ordinary Martinican people, survivors of colonial onslaught, in order to tell their story with them. Now, in composing the trial of Dedan Kimathi, Ngogi and I were not only highly aware of all the dialectics and sites of contestation that I have outlined above, but also deeply conscious of our role as artists in the challenging task of denouncing colonial and imperialist misnaming and misrepresentation of the history of the Kenya Land and Freedom Army, or so-called Mau Mau, and its leader, Field Marshal Dead and Kimathi. And Gogi and I just went off on, with our imagination to reimagine and rename these sites that had been maligned under colonialism. So then, while feeling the urgency to embark on the work of renaming and self naming, we were also keenly aware of the fact that we could not do this authentically without revisiting indigenous sites of knowledge, such as living witnesses and orator, including 
oral historical narratives, myths, legends, stories, songs, and so forth. We needed these counter-narratives to debate with accounts like Elspeth Huxley's A Thing to Love, or Ian Henderson's The Hunt for Kimathi, Robert Ruach's Uhuru, and Something of Value, LSB Leakey's Mau Mau and the Kikuyu, defeating Mau Mau and others. Indeed, in the year 1974, two years before the publication of The Trial of Dead and Kimathi, we came across another version that seemed to us very close to these colonial sources. It was a play by Kenyan playwright Kenneth Watene that was performed at the Kenya National Theatre, which at this time, at the time was a site where Africans were not welcome. It was a place that was reserved for whites only, even though we were 10 years into um, independence. So we saw this play, and the play seemed to us to be the latest narrative at the time, confirming most of the false namings and stereotypes that were unleashed upon Kimathi and the KLFA by colonial sources and their agents. In many of these colonial accounts, anyway, false naming is methodical and it's deliberate. Ngoge has spoken to the meaninglessness of the term Mau Mau, but besides this outrage, all manner of other vicious terms were used by the colonials to malign the fighters, such as terrorists, or in the Gikuyu language, itoi. Actually, in, Kikuyu, in the Gikuyu language, it's a very ugly word, itoi, which can also translate into heartless criminals or evildoers. Or imaramari, even worse, you can hear even the onomatopoeic sounding, imaramari, was another term that would mean something like roaming wild lawless vagabonds. Some even called the fighters oragani, killers, and one could go on. I remember that there were stories and myths we were told as children that they used to drink people's blood. And this made us fear these cannibals that were out there in the forest. But in any case, this false naming criminalized the freedom fighters, depicting them as inhumane beasts whose single mission was to engage in senseless bloodshed. These patriots were painted as purposeless destroyers and enemies of the people. Kimadi was vilified as a cruel dictator who ruled through fear and terror. Some accounts even depicted him as an egomaniac and psychopath who had no heart. Conversely, the masses and supporters of the KLFA had alternative namings for these very same fighters referring to them in endearing language, such as itungati, a term that loosely translates into those who serve, the servants of the people. They also endearingly referred to them as anake or iheshia mutitu, boys of the forest, or as njamba shiaburudi, heroes of the land. They loved and revered Field Marshal Dedan Kimathi. Now, thus reading counter narratives such as Karari Njama's Mau Mau from within, J.M. Kariuki's Mau Mau Detainee, and other autobiographical accounts by former freedom fighters, and even more importantly, as I have said, discovering or richer sources and narratives that told completely different stories of Kimathi and the KLFA, then listening to some living witnesses who knew Kimathi. Ngugi and I came up with alternative forms of naming. In the preface to our play, The Trial of Dead and Kimathi, we share our experiences from a research trip that took us to Karunaini, Kimathi's place of birth. The oral narratives the people we met shared spoke of a Kimathi that was completely antithetical to the one of colonial naming. A lengthy quotation from the preface summarizing these witnesses' memories of Kimathi will help clinch the point that I'm trying to make here, I quote. Ngogi and I say, the writing of the trial of Dedan Kimathi has been both challenging and exciting. 
It has put us through a lot of education in connection with the continuing struggle against economic and other forms of oppression. We also discovered that Kimathi was still a hero of the Kenyan masses. One day, for instance, we visited Kimathi's birthplace with the aim of eliciting a first-hand assessment of Kimathi from the people who had known him as a child, a villager, and guerrilla hero. Karunaini people were very proud of their son. They talked of him as a dedicated teacher, committed organizer of a theater group that he had named in the village Gichamu, as a man with a tremendous sense of humor who could keep a house roaring with laughter. They talked of his warm personality and his love of people. He was clearly their beloved son, their respected leader, and they talked of him as still being alive. Kemathi will never die, the woman among that crowd told us. Then she continued and said, but if you people have killed him, go, go, show us his grave. She said this in a strange tone and voice between defiance and bitterness. And for a minute, we all kept quiet. Now, you may argue that this is a romanticization of the um, hero, and that's okay, as Paulo Freire tells us, especially among colonized people, to have positive myths about yourselves is very, very healthy, because that way you are cleaning out the false myths that you have been fed with. The only thing is to learn to recognize between facts and imagination, and also to understand the difference between reality and the creations of our imagination, which are very, very healthy. So then, in the trial of Dead and Kimathi, we have tried to honor and preserve these counter-narratives, using them to remap and rename the shaky ground upon which the false myths of colonial and imperialist history leave Kimathi standing. We have tried to show that the Kenya liberation struggle was not a civil war as such, but a war about occupation ignited by the oppressive conditions imposed upon the masses of Kenya by empire builders with white colonial settlers as occupiers. We have contested the notion that the struggle was a Kikuyu affair by evoking the presence of forest fighters from communities such as the Maasai, Nandi, Kipsigis, Samburu, Kisi, Akamba. And indeed, they were not in plenty. There were a few of them, but symbolically, this was very, very important. And this is not to deny the fact that the majority of fighters were from central Kenya, because after all, this is where the lands had been seized and renamed White Highland. Rather, it's an attempt to demonstrate that this was a Kenyan people's national struggle. And beyond this, as we heard from the panel this morning, the land, Kenya Land Freedom Army, and Kimathi in particular, were terribly conscious of other struggles going on around the continent, around the world internationally and globally, and kept referring to them and comparing the experiences of oppressed Kenyan masses with what was happening in those other situations of war. So then, we have tried in this work to um, create through the forest scenes and the meetings that take place there under the leadership of Kimathi. A Kimathi that explores the myth that the KLFA was an incoherent movement with no sense of organization or direction. Uh, furthermore, through the forest scenes, we interrogate the false myth that Kimathi did not know his fellow fighters and that he worked single-handedly, dictator style. Through the forest scenes in the play, we have attempted to reconstruct, to relive, to remap, to rename the forest sites of Nyandarwa and Kirinyaga using the information that we had gathered from alternative sources in Oricha. We have also introduced the presence of women and youth in the struggle, giving a major character such as woman a major role in the play. 
Whereas we recognize the negative impact of patriarchal traditions and male dominations in liberation struggles, especially in situations of war, with KLFA no exception, we nonetheless find it important to debunk the myth that the KLFA was entirely a male affair. In fact, I can't remember which governor, whether Sir Evelyn Baring or whether Patrick Renison, who said, had it not been for the women and their participation as the backbone of this movement, they would have defeated um, the liberation struggle a long time ago. Moreover, we have introduced oracha and oracy as important sites for renaming and self-naming through orations, through stories, through storytelling, through songs, through dances, through myths and legends. You know, people's own self-expression of who they are. We have tried to live up to America Cabral's call to the colonial intelligentsia to return to the source. Lastly, we have renamed the site of Kemathi's trial by depicting it as a place of terror and dehumanization and injustice, not justice. Just as importantly, we have linked it to other imperialist courts of oppression and injustice, going back, Sankofa-like once again, to the history of the transatlantic slave trade, while leaping forward to forge connections with New colonialism, international and transnational capitalism. This renaming makes the trial historically real, while metaphorically pushing it beyond the confinement of any given historical space, especially considering the transnational nature and global character of imperialism and empire building. All said, however, it is to the workers and peasants and masses of Kenya and their global compatriots that we give the final word. As they sing a song of defiance, self-naming and victory, following Kemathi's sentencing, vowing to continue fighting injustice, moving together forward in unity as one mighty, forceful river flowing unstoppably. We have renamed the masses as the heroes and sheroes of history, as agents of history, and not as passive victims. Thank you very much. That's it for Africa World Now project for this week. I would like to thank you for joining us today and look forward to spending time with you next week. We can be reached through all your regular social media platforms. Email AfricaWorldNowProject at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at A-F-W-R-L-D-N-W-P-R-J. I'm your host and producer, James Pope. The Africa World Now Project Collective consists of international media journalist, executive producer, and human rights activist, Mouisa Matali, Africa World Now Project media correspondent, Funa Ngonda, and technology advisor is Byron Gray of GreatWorks Technologies. Africa World Now Project is heard every Wednesday at 7 p.m. on WSNC 90.5, a broadcasting service of Winston-Salem State University. Until next week, be peaceful, be safe, and above all, be intelligent.